So uh, thanks, uh, Howard, for inviting me to give you a progress report on our virtual scientist project at Notre Dame. It's a pleasure to be with the Wisdom Forum. You know, it would not take very long uh, for any gathering of university professors to lament the incurious or desultory intellectual climate of their classrooms or the absence of genuine engagement with ideas by students. Although no disciplinary major is immune from such concerns, uh, there is a concern uh, how they affect science classes, if only because science is widely acknowledged as the premier knowledge uh, generating enterprise, and if anything can deliver the epistemic goods, it's science. This was the concern of the Virtuous Scientist Project uh, at Notre Dame a year or two ago. Uh, the project leaders secured a planning grant from the Templeton Foundation to figure out how to inject college science education with a strong dose of intellectual virtues. And I was invited to write a literature review on intellectual virtues. Now, I don't know anything about intellectual virtues, so of course I said yes. <laughs> And as our work unfolded, uh, we began to think more expansively about the role of inte intellectual virtues in science and society beyond the college classroom, acknowledging the many challenges that confront contemporary science, including those of ethics and trust and transparency internal to the scientific enterprise, and challenges that confront a science literate citizenry when science denialism, alternative facts, and post-truth ideology a corrupt public discourse about matters of almost existential urgency. So recent editorials in prominent journals, science journals, lament the undervaluing of scientific evidence and how easily scientific consensus is ignored in the service of ideological agendas. The, the editorials argued that the methods of science need to be defended as one core value of modern society, and that scientists themselves need to accept some of the blame for the post-truth post reality. So when scientists publish fabricated data or cherry pick data to support their scientific claims or engage in p-hacking or harking or tout misleading credentials or game the peer review system or tolerate plagiarism uh, and cloud the transparency with respect to conflicts of interest, these practices call into question the integrity of scientists and undermine confidence in scientific consensus. These failings undoubtedly reflect the want of virtue among some scientists, we would claim. But there's also widespread misunderstanding in public discourse about the very nature of science and the epistemic claims that it makes and our intellectual stance towards them, a misunderstanding that scientists are obliged to correct. So the Virtuous Scientist Project is concerned to reform college science education to better prepare science majors for post-baccalaureate science careers, certainly but also to equip students with intellectual virtues that conduce to good citizenship at a time when science denialism and comfort with alternative facts is rife in public policy debates. Science education is not just for scientists anymore. We argue that training better scientists and science literate citizens is an adjunct to forming better persons, and that science education is in the business of character formation. So the big problem before, is, before us is how to do this, how do we educate science students in a way that include the formation of intellectual virtues with the expectation that intellectual virtues will conduce to better scientific practice and also fortify the scientists against temptations to expediency and fraud or misconduct? Second, how do we educate students in the nature, methods, and limits of science and the epistemic claims that it makes? Well, it soon became clear that we had to come to grips with two literatures, one in virtue of epistemology, which is a field of philosophy that takes up the matter of intellectual virtues, and the other, the epistemic cognition literature, which resides in educational psychology. We think the potential contribution of the Virtuous Scientist Project would be to find powerful integrative linkages between the two disciplines, these two fields of study, between virtue epistemology and science epistemology, in the cause of science education. Virtue epistemology in its responsibilist form affirms that the dispositions of the agent and the formation of his or her character is crucial to intellectual formation. Unlike traditional epistemology where beliefs are the primary objects of evaluation and where knowledge and belief justification are foundational, in virtue epistemology agents are the primary objects of evaluation and intellectual virtues and vices are foundational. Put differently, intellectual virtues and vices attached to character as dispositions. 
I will say parenthetically almost that, almost that how much work intellectual virtues are supposed to do in addressing traditional problems of epistemology has resulted in robust philosophical discussion. And at least four other options are possible, with conservative views thinking that virtue epistemology has important work to do to solve problems of knowledge, while autonomous views argue for an independent or complementary role. And there are strong and weak versions of, of those options as represented by these philosophers. I only bring this up uh, to anticipate a point I want to make in a slide or two, that we can ask similar questions about the relationship between intellectual virtues and epistemic cognition. How much work should intellectual virtues do in accounting for, uh, for epistemic cognition? I think at least four options are also possible here, at least in theory, except no one has articulated them uh, to this date, so this is wide open territory for research. But it's hardly possible to care about the truth, to pursue a question with dogged, careful perseverance, to interrogate the evidence carefully, to be industrious and open to surprise, to want to learn from others, to treat interlocutors and critics in their texts with justice, to participate in the shared collaborative work of science. It's impossible to do these things without love of knowledge, without open-mindedness, intellectual humility and courage, without curiosity, a sense of firmness and fairness, and other virtues. Forming the agent's character is key to the work of science and for the life of the mind that aims for epistemic goods. But science education also requires deep integration with epistemic cognition literatures of educational psychology and the learning sciences. There are two broad traditions of research in this area. There are various developmental models of epistemological reasoning back when stage theories were all the rage, and also a system of beliefs uh, work that track individuals' understanding of epistemic beliefs along dimensions rather than stages. So the model developed by Marlene Schomer and the Pintrick Hofer model have attracted the most attention, but some authors have called for expanding the domain of epistemic cognition uh, in various ways, but that won't detain me here. My more general point is that the virtuous scientist, on our view, is in full possession of intellectual virtues that are indispensable to effective scientific practice, but also deep appreciation of the epistemic claims of science itself. At the outset of our project, we anticipated that the epistemic cognition literature would provide benchmarks for appraising the effectiveness of science education uh, and, and the effectiveness of whatever reform that we do. Uh, we should hope that effective science education results in more sophisticated epistemic understanding and hope that science education moves the needle on some of these dimensions of belief. Is science education up to this task? Well, we don't know, probably not. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, Clark Chin at Rutgers and Bill Sandoval at UCLA find that school science often encourages uh, a personal epistemology that's antithetical to the epistemology of formal science. Uh, I'm going to pass over this uh, quote from them in the interest of time. There's been a lot of progress, however, over the years in the learning sciences to, to improve authentic inquiry uh, of school science and to document growth in understanding the central tenets of science epistemology. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, Bill Sandoval suggests that these should be the four core things that we should know about science epistemology as a result of our science education. All right, let me, I just have a few minutes left. Let me summarize where I think we're going with our project. Uh, okay. So let me summarize the Virtue Scientist Project. We envision a unified approach to science education that combines virtue epistemology and epistemic reasoning about science. Uh, the virtuous scientist has well-cultivated intellectual virtues and sophisticated understanding of the epistemic claims of science. There are two ways that science education can fail. It can fail when it addresses only the factual claims of science without cultivating intellectual virtues. And it also fails if, we cultivate, if it fails to cultivate sophisticated ideas about the very nature of science itself. Okay. Now, we think we've identified an interesting intellectual space that's been largely unexplored. I was tempted to call this a triarchic theory, but apparently that word has been taken. <laughs> Uh, an interesting intellectual space. Uh, the premise of our project is that synergetic integration of these literatures should underwrite transformative reform of college science education. Uh, there's always been a strong link between the epistemic ed psych literatures and science education, at least at the K-12 level. We don't know much about how this works at the college level, however. Uh, 
there's very little. Uh, the epistemic cognition people do trade on traditional epistemology to define their field of study. It puts the epistemic and epistemic cognition, but, but almost no familiarity with the virtue of epistemology <laughs> literatures. Okay. Um, and again, I raise the question, how much, how much uh, work should, virtue, should intellectual virtues play in this? I think it works the other way as well. Uh, with respect to um, education, the philosophers who write about, uh, about, care, or, or about, about these virtues invoke what I call the Aristotelian trifecta. So, so how do you train intellectual virtues in students? They say, well, you need formal instruction, you need exemplars, and you need practice. You need lots of practice. So I want to come back to that. Uh, I think that science identity is a construct that would occupy this interesting intellectual space and both virtue epistemology and epistemic cognition need a concept of science identity but for different reasons. Uh, and that leads to several hypotheses uh, that forming intellectual virtues is a special kind of personality development that is ideally the project of college age emerging adults. The construct of self-identity is useful for capturing the dispositional features of personality and is ideally the target of character-based approaches to intellectual virtue, and that the goal uh, of science education is the development of science identity, and that both the philosophy of intellectual virtues and the psychology of epistemic cognition requires such a concept. Okay, so in instructional implications. Uh, the philosopher Heather Badley wrote, with, with respect to the Aristotelian trifecta, that Aristotelians think that with enough practice and positive reinforcement, we will not only learn how to act and feel the way that virtuous people do, but to care about what virtuous people care about. Uh, that's probably not the case. Uh, thinking through what formal instruction requires uh, and exposure to exemplars and what practice amounts to will probably require less of Aristotle and more of educational learning sciences. It will, it will not be just any formal instruction, but formal instruction informed by the best practice pedagogical literatures. It is not mere exposure to exemplars, but rather the quality of the relationship uh, with them that will be decisive, that will encourage the internalization of norms and motivate the formation of science identity. And it's not practice simpliciter, but mentored practice, expert guidance in pointing out the significance of events informed tutorship in a Vygotskyan zone of proximal development along with other constructs. So we think there's a lot to gain by conceptualizing intellectual virtues as analogs of cognitive strategies and using the development of learning strategies as a model of virtue development. This is what Aristotelian mentored practice or formal instruction or exposure to exemplars will look like. So in our view, deploying an intellectual virtue should be akin to deploying specific strategy knowledge. It should be like learning what the late Mike, Mike Presley and my Notre Dame colleague John Borkowski once called meta-memory acquisition procedures. We conjecture that there are advantages to thinking about the possibility of specific strategy knowledge and map me mechanisms involved in learning uh, to deploy the requisite intellectual virtues. And here I'm channeling Aristotle, in the right situation, at the right time, and in the right way and that a virtuous tutor tasked with bringing up a student or protege in, in, in the intellectual virtues should also uh, be well tutored in the literatures of the learning sciences. So I'm going to stop now. I think the intellectual virtues perspective can be usefully linked to the wisdom literature in ways I only vaguely understand just now and, and maybe also provides language and perspective to walk us back from Samara. So let me stop. Before I thank you, let me thank my... Uh, uh, Gray Crawford is now the president of Miami University in Ohio, and Dom Chalaner, uh, they, they had the planning grant from which I wrote the lit review. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. This, this was great, uh, even though I don't think I understood more than 20%. Um, uh, uh, okay, uh, it was great because it totally resonates with a piece that I uh, wrote this year for European psychologists specifically deal with exemplars so that you just can just take exemplars and then like you learn wisdom by formally training exemplars. So I completely agree with you there. You need to have some kind of a contextual approach, Vygotskyan approach possibly. Um, but um, my question, uh, and this is just really a clarification question. Um, your talk was really uh, rich but abstract. 
um, as typical to philosophy and when you try to bridge different fields. Uh, but what exactly do you mean with intellectual virtues? At some point you had the table there with uh, Kitchener and uh, uh, Perry and so on. Do you mean this kind of reflective abilities? I mean, if I, w if I were to, uh, as an empiricist, to measure it or to evaluate it, what exactly would you suggest we should be focusing no, on? And so you don't need to be specific, uh, no, but no, if I, you could I, provide some examples, it would be great. Be yeah. So I, I want to draw a distinction between two fields of study. One is the, the epistemic cognition field. That's what they're calling it now. It's, it resides in educational psychology. And that was the, the, the pentrick hofer model, the Schomer model, uh, the developmental models. That resides in educational sciences. On the philosophy side, uh, they talk about intellectual virtues, and so some examples of those would be like open-mindedness or okay. uh, uh, intellectual courage and humility, uh, be, okay. being, being able to tr treat a critic or, or interlocutor with justice and fairness, and, and being able to submit your point of view to better evidence would be examples of intellectual virtue. Yeah, the, those, now, there the, are those assessment are the problems, there's huge yep. assessment yep. problems yep. I, I'm sure someone's going to ask me about. We don't entirely know about some of this. I think we, I'm interested in the concept of science identity. I think that's going to have a lot of legs. I think the, 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 the synergy among these fields will be anchored in this. Uh, there's more to say about why I think it's needed before both those fields. Uh, but, but how to measure that, I think we'll have to take some insights from the personality literature on how to do that. Yeah, we, we can talk. Okay, <laughs> good. I'm Nancy Snow. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I, I am interested in a couple of uh, points that you made. One is uh, I believe that Jason Baer has done some work on wisdom and understanding as intellectual virtues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sort of interested in how you would bring the notion of wisdom into your concept of science identity and how expansive your concept of science identity is. The uh, example I have in the back of my mind is the Manhattan Project. And I read a book about the Manhattan Project some time ago, which consisted of some um, essays and reflections on the part of the scientists who were involved in that. And it was clear that they had gotten caught up in uh, uh, a race and that they were getting incorrect information from the government about what should be happening in terms of developing that project. And they moved forward in ways that could be considered consistent with a science identity, but would not have been consistent, in my opinion, with uh, a broader concept of wisdom, mm -hmm. given the political circumstances. No, that's a, yeah, so Jason Baer is uh, just a wonderful philosopher. He has uh, actually participated in the formation of a middle school where they teach intellectual virtues. And he has resources online where you can go to and find out more about how he does that in his college classes and how they do it at that school. It's basically the Aristotelian trifecta, mostly. Uh, but Nancy asked a great question. Is it, is it not possible that one can identify the self so completely with science that you miss other moral considerations? And so in, in the philosophical literature, there's more to virtue than intellectual virtue. And so one of the live debates is, what's the distinction between moral virtue, morality, and intellectual character? How much do they overlap? Uh, and I think Jason Baer would argue that both intellectual virtue and moral virtue and civic virtue actually share a common motivational structure, and that you do these things for intrinsic purposes, um, but you can't do it in the absence of overall moral consideration as well. So I really enjoyed your talk. Thank um, you, so I guess, um, I guess my question is a bit of a flip of Nancy's question, which, so when I was listening to, your, listening to your talk, I was thinking about uh, a methods class that I teach at Wake Forest, which is a research and methods class for psychology minors. Mm -hmm. So it's a class that trains students to be good consumers of research. Yeah. So I saw a lot of parallels. So this got me thinking about, you know, have you thought about syllabi? Have you thought about how much time it would take to properly train undergraduates in this type of curriculum? Yeah. Because in order to, you know, train students in the intellectual virtues, in science identity. Do you have a sense of how many semesters it would take? What type of curricula you would need? Yeah. How assessment, I think Igor's yeah. point is a so good I one. Had, you know, I teach research methods as well at Notre yeah. Dame, and I, I turned immediately to how I would rework my own college syllabus, and mm -hmm. Jason Baer has done this. He has guidelines online about yeah. how he does his own course, mm -hmm. so I think part of it is uh, the first, uh, and I don't think it takes an inordinate amount of time either. I think you can just have structure, the first couple meetings talk about um, 
what intellectual virtues are, what are the signs of them. I'm going to have my students read a book called The Seven Deadly Sins of Psychology, which just, just came out, which, in, in, which is just rife with just problems of, that scientists or psychologists get, get involved in. Uh, I also don't think that science classes or methods classes are the only place to do that. You know, when you talk about exemplars, some of the most powerful, well, a book that had a powerful effect on me is a, a, a book called uh, Intellectual Character uh, by Roberts and Wood, they're philosophers. And a lot of their examples are, are not from science at all, they're from literature. And I think, uh, I think there's a case to be made for liberal arts education for learning about, you know, the important dispositional intellectual virtues that come out of the Karamazov and uh, you know other great novelists. You know, I think you can plumb these. So I think the general uh, education you get at, at the university could also be a form for talking about intellectual virtues if the agenda was more bri broadly shared beyond science classes or methods classes within science. Mm -hmm. oh. No. Oh, I need the mic for recording, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Peggy Pluzogan from University of Virginia. So a lot of what you're talking about reminds me of our professional identity formation uh, line of thought yes. in medicine. Um, and one of the things I'm becoming more convinced of is that teaching about this is different from actually mentoring it. And it's in the mentoring, it's in the integration of experience that the scientist, perhaps, certainly the physician, learns to live these virtues um, and apply knowledge in a way that is consistent with being practically wise. Right. So how do you envision um, integrating those, h helping students uh, integrate those particularly crucible kinds of experiences? Yeah. Yeah, so there is actually a literature on science identity. I don't have a good handle on that literature yet, so I think I'm going to be plumbing that. And, and there's, for example, there's research on STEM identity. For example, I, don't, I need to learn more about that if there's anything there. Uh, I, one thing I didn't get a chance to mention is that we think that uh, the integration of the, the formal instruction, the exposure to exemplars, and the practice comes through uh, the formation of a community of practice as an idea. Uh, and so we build, we work in teams and community. We, we all have labs now, and I think if we, re, if we can re -think, rethink how we do labs and rethink how we do classrooms, I suppose, as a, as a, as a community of practice, I think that's the key. That's the thing that's going to integrate it all, I think. So we need to learn more about how to do that well. That's, there's probably literature on that. Jim. I'm sorry, I'm calling out people. You should. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, just to, to take that a step further, I mean, you've been talking about scientific identity, um, and that's helpful at the individual level, but individuals live within a context of a culture. Um, and, and I guess I wonder if um, this concept that I uncovered recently as I was reading about complexity um, may be helpful, which is this notion of a moral economy of science. Oh. Um, and in this case, moral is not referring to morals, but it's referring to sort of like an 18th century definition, it's a normative behavior with a, with a psychologic component. And economy is um, about a, a, a system that operates with some logic. Mm -hmm. And so unless we change, I guess, the moral economy of science that presently exists, which has a tendency to focus on reductionism as opposed to incorporating these other elements of what it means to be a scientist or a physician, um, mm -hmm. those um, aspects of wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, unless we change that, it's going to be hard to really just sort of teach people uh, to, um, to, I guess, incorporate um, all of this into their behavior because the moral economy will continue through self-restraint and reward to reward those people who are successful on the more analytical side um, as opposed to those people who can combine that with these other traits that we think we'd like to, to bring into mm -hmm. the picture. But that moral economy of science was sort of the concept. Yeah, there. so the moral economy uh, of science, you know, uh, uh, Notre Dame philosopher Alistair McIntyre makes a distinction. 
in his great book, After Virtue, between goods internal to practice and goods external to practice. And, and so much of our scientific work is driven by the goods external to practice, right? It's getting the grants and getting publication in high impact journals and all the rest. And, and so I think that has it. You know, we, we want students to love the science for the goods internal to the practice, for the love of knowledge piece. So I think their intention, that, that's how I understand the comment of moral economy. We have two, two goods, and, and it's no, there's nothing wrong about seeking the goods of excellence external to practice. I mean, that's perfectly fine. It motivates us. It's why we all show up here. You know, but I think uh, it can get out of whack. I think we sometimes lose. We, uh, when you look, talk about the, the seven deadly sins of psychology, I think we're tempted uh, to uh, maybe compromise the, our internal moral compass when it comes to scientific practice. So. Thank you.